Hello, in this video I'd like to talk about the philosophical consequences of Fractran being Turing complete. In particular, what this means for the Collatz conjecture. So we're looking at the Collatz function here, a function from natural numbers to natural numbers, and it's a piecewise function where the pieces depend on the modular remainders of the input. In this case, it's remainders mod 2. And each of the pieces is a linear polynomial whose coefficients are rational numbers. Another way of looking at this function is that the function takes in an input and multiplies it by one half if it can, that is, if that will keep it a natural number, and if not, multiplies by three and adds one. As far as we've been able to tell, whenever we iteratively apply this function to a positive integer input, it will eventually get down to one and get caught in a loop 421, 421, 421, and so on and so forth. But we haven't been able to prove this. We haven't been able to prove that there aren't numbers that we could start at that would cause this series to go off to infinity or get us stuck in a different loop. So there's sort of a natural generalization of the Collatz function. We can take a function that applies a linear polynomial with rational coefficients depending on the remainder of the input modulo sum modulus. And these rational coefficients have to be picked specifically uh, so that uh, based on the modulus, there's a guarantee that the output of the function will always be a natural number when we input a natural number. Now, of course, it's very easy to build versions of functions like this that uh, when we iteratively apply them, go off to infinity or get stuck in all sorts of different loops. Uh, there's lots of behavior that we could wind up having. But there is some hope that perhaps if we had a solution to the Collatz conjecture, we could apply whatever tools we had developed in order to fully analyze these more general functions when they're being iterated. Some sort of tool that could tell us for a particular function which inputs uh, when we iterate these functions uh, go off to infinity or get caught in uh, which loops. So Fractran is sort of a specific case of these more general Collatz functions. So first of all, we're going to get rid of entirely the, um, the addition terms. Each piece is just going to be multiply the input by some rational number, and the rational number that we pick is going to depend on the modular remainders of the input. And we're going to do this in a very specific way. So uh, a specification for one of these functions, uh, which I'm going to call a program, uh, because we're, we're going to want to think of Fractran as a programming language, is a list of rational numbers, a list of fractions. And what our function is going to do is it's going to take the input and multiply it by the first fraction in the list that gives us a natural number. And again, we're going to be interested in what happens if we iteratively apply this function to arbitrary inputs. Now, this isn't quite an example of our generalized Collatz functions. Uh, it is the case that which fraction we're multiplying by just depends on the modular remainder information of the input. But this is a partial function, whereas our generalized Collatz functions were total functions. You can code your way around that, so it really isn't that big a deal in terms of the analysis. But what this means is that we won't be able to apply our Fractran function to particular inputs. So I said that we wanted to interpret this as a program, and what we're going to do is we're going to imagine taking an input value and applying our function to that input value until we can't anymore. That is, until we get a value that can't be multiplied by any of the fractions in the list. And the resulting value that we get, that the, the value that can't be multiplied by any of the fractions in the list, is going to be our output value. So for instance, if we started off with the number 160, the first fraction in the list that we can multiply by is 3 fourths. That gives us 120. 120 we can also multiply by 3 fourths to get 90. 90 we can't multiply by 3 fourths to get a natural number, um, but we can multiply by 14 ninths, so we do that to get 140. 140 we again can multiply by 3 fourths to get 105. 105 we can't multiply by any of the fractions in the list until we get to the very last one, 2 fifths, 
So we multiply by 2 fifths to get 42. 42, we can't multiply by 3 fourths. We can't multiply by 14 ninths, but we can multiply by 11 halves. So we do so to get 231. And 231, we can't multiply by any of the fractions in the list, and so we stop. So I'll say that if we input 160 into our program, it outputs 231. And of course, for some Fractran programs and some inputs, this process might not terminate. It might go off to infinity or get caught in an infinite loop. So it turns out that Fractran is Turing complete. For the summer of math exposition, I put together an interactive that walks you through a, a series of programming puzzles in order to hopefully convince you that you could use Fractran to program whatever you wanted, and in fact that Fractran is Turing complete. And I also have a walkthrough video in case you get stuck on that interactive or would prefer a lecture explanation as to why Fractran is Turing complete. I'll link both of them down below. Now, there are a few things that we could hope when I say that Fractran is Turing complete. Uh, Fractran programs take natural numbers to natural numbers, so one could hope that uh, any uh, function from natural numbers to natural numbers, or any partial function where we allow the possibility of not halting, uh, that is given by some computer program in a Turing complete programming language could be translated into an equivalent Fractran program. But unfortunately, that isn't quite possible. A Fractran program can only introduce a finite number of prime factors. Specifically, the, the only prime factors that can show up in the output are either prime factors of the original input or prime factors of the numerator of the fractions in the program. On the other hand, we can easily build computer programs that introduce whatever prime factors we want, uh, such as the round up to the nearest prime function. But if we're willing to do a coding argument, any computer program that calculates some sort of partial function from natural numbers to natural numbers can be compiled, and I use this word intentionally, Fractran is very much like an assembly language, and the process of translating a computer program into Fractran is very similar to that of compiling the original programming language. So our program can be compiled to a Fractran program that takes numbers of the form 2 to the n times 11 to numbers of the form 2 to the f of n. And of course, doesn't halt uh, if the original program doesn't halt on input n. Now, if you're curious why we're looking at powers of 2, why that 11 is there, I encourage you to go through my interactive or watch my walkthrough video, and that should hopefully give you a good intuition as to why we're using this particular coding technique. So the fact that Fractran is Turing complete actually has a number of really difficult consequences. Perhaps the simplest is that if we have some sort of computer program that's very difficult to analyze mathematically, we can translate it into a Fractran program to get a Fractran program that's very difficult to analyze mathematically. And of course, that Fractran program we can translate into a generalized Colots problem that, again, is going to be very difficult to analyze mathematically. It's very easy to write a computer program that brute force searches for odd perfect numbers, either uh, halting if it finds one or going on forever in its search if it doesn't find one. And so, of course, in order to be able to analyze this computer program, uh, and thus the corresponding Fractran program, and thus the corresponding colots like function, we need to know whether or not there are odd perfect numbers, and we currently do not know. And there are a wide variety of open, difficult problems in mathematics that can very easily be translated into the question of whether a particular computer program halts or not. But the situation is more complicated than that. We know that there is no general algorithm that, given a computer program, always tells you correctly whether or not it halts. And that means that there is no algorithm that, given a Fractran program, can definitely tell you whether or not it halts. Because we could use that to tell whether any program halted just by translating it into the appropriate Fractran program. 
So that rules out a straightforward computational way of analyzing the behavior of generalized colots like functions. Things get even trickier when we start to get model theory involved. So think of your favorite formal proof system, a collection of axioms along with a series of techniques for uh, making deductions from those axioms. Let's call this proof system P. Then there's a program, which I'm going to call VEX, and this will depend on the particular proof system that we're looking at. And this program will not halt and cannot be proved to not halt in your particular proof system. So of course, we know that it doesn't halt, and we can show that it doesn't halt, but the proof is outside of the proof system that you've handed us. And this program could be a program in your favorite Turing complete programming language, uh, including Fractran. As a consequence of this, assuming that there are any models of set theory or piano or arithmetic at all, there are models of ZFC set theory and piano or arithmetic where this particular program halts, and there are models where it doesn't. Again, the idea is that, of course, in our world, uh, this VEX program doesn't halt, but there are versions of set theory, versions of the natural numbers, uh, where this program does halt. So I suppose I should clarify what I'm talking about here when I talk about proof systems. Mathematicians really like proving things, and they really like formalizing things. And so there's a strong desire in mathematics to formalize what it means to prove something. Now, this could mean all sorts of things, but the most important thing is that no matter how you choose to formalize what it means to prove something, it should be the case that uh, our proofs are encoded in some way that a computer can recognize whether or not the proof is valid. And this tends to be something like a proof is a list of logical formulas that we know are true, and why could we know that they're true? Well, it could be the case that they're axioms. It could be the case that they're givens. That is, we're trying to prove that A implies B, and so we're allowed to assume A and try to prove B. Or it could be the case that a line in our proof is an inference from previous lines. And we have very precise rules about what we're allowed as axioms, of course, the givens are very limited for our specific cases, and there's very precise rules about what inferences we're allowed to make on any one particular line of our proof. And, of course, a computer should be able to recognize when these things are correct, when we've handed it a correct axiom, and when we've handed it a correct inference. So here's an example of a formal proof. We have five lines to it, and the thing that we're trying to prove uh, is the very last line. Each of these lines, the first two lines are givens from the problem. The third line is an axiom that we just have from the system that we're working in. And then the fourth and fifth lines are what's called modus ponens. This is an inference rule. If we know that A is true and we know that A implies B, then we can conclude B. And this doesn't just apply for the logical variables A and B but it applies for any sorts of expressions that we want. So there's a pattern matching going on here. If we know that A is true and we know that A implies B, then we know that B is true and we can write that down as one of our lines. But of course, computers are perfectly capable of pattern matching and thus being able to tell if we have correctly used the modus ponens rule. So a computer would be perfectly happy to verify this proof for us. Now, at least the intuition for me is that when I'm writing a proof, I could, by simply expanding out each of the steps of the proof that I'm writing, um, making it more and more formal, breaking everything apart into their definitions, I could turn my proof into something that was uh, very strict, very formal, uh, went line by line, and only used the axioms or definitions of whatever system I'm working in. Of course, doing this in practice is incredibly tedious. There's a system online called Metamath that uses this pattern matching process uh, in order to allow us to write these computer verifiable proofs. This here is a proof that the square root of 2 is irrational, but most of the lines of this proof aren't actually axioms or 
applications of inference rules, but actually uh, references to other things that have been proved with similar proofs. So the actual proof that convinces the computer that the square root of 2 is irrational is actually many times longer than what you see here. These systems tend to be very tedious to work with, and while it is a comfort to know that our proofs are in fact correct, only a small number of mathematicians actually use these sorts of formal proof systems in order to verify their work. Mathematicians don't talk about the details of proof systems very often because the details of our proof system don't matter that much. There's kind of a Turing completeness-like phenomenon for proof systems in that pretty much all of the ones that we care about are all of the same power. In particular, all of the ones that we care about are as powerful as possible. So there's this wonderful theorem, it's a combination of the soundness theorem and Gödel's completeness theorem, that provability is the same as model theoretic consequence. What do I mean by that? Well, if from A we can prove B in our proof system, that is, the, you know, there's a sequence of lines that allows us to get from A to B, just applying our proof rules, then any structure satisfying A must satisfy B. This is what it means for a proof system to be sound, but really it just means that the proof system is sensible. We can come up with all sorts of formalized proof systems. For instance, we could say that any statement containing two addition signs is true. This is of course absurd, but it is incredibly formal. We have a very precise notion of what is provable and what is not provable within this proof system. However, this formal proof system does not satisfy soundness. If from A we can prove B, that tells us nothing about whether structures satisfy B. In some sense, soundness says that we're only able to prove true things about structures using our proof system. The reverse, Gödel's completeness theorem, says that if any structure satisfying A must satisfy B, then from A we can prove B. Any conclusions we can draw from A in terms of structures uh, necessarily have to be provable in our formal proof system. And again, we can interpret this as saying that our formal proof system is as powerful as possible. It may be helpful here to talk about syntactic and semantic consequence. Syntactic consequence refers to our proof system. Our proof system is simply a formal symbol manipulation system. And so if from A we can prove B, we'll say that B is a syntactic consequence of A. There's also a notion of semantic consequence uh, in terms of the meanings of A and B. And when I say meaning here, I'm distinguishing, we can see A and B as just strings of symbols that we can manipulate according to symbolic rules, but A and B also describe properties, properties that structures can satisfy. And so we say that B is a semantic consequence of A if any structure satisfying A must also satisfy B. B is a consequence of A in terms of structures. And these theorems together tell us that semantic and syntactic consequence are identical for the proof systems that we're talking about. It might be helpful to look at a specific case of this phenomenon. If there's a structure satisfying A, uh, then hopefully you cannot prove a contradiction from A. Right? A is a thing that could be true. It's true of some structures, maybe it's false of other structures, but it's a thing that could be true. And so hopefully you can't prove a contradiction from A because then you could prove a contradiction of a structure satisfying A. Either the structure is itself contradictory or our notion of proof isn't really capturing truth about structures. So that's a consequence of soundness. A consequence of completeness is that if we cannot prove a contradiction from A, then there's a structure satisfying A. Unless there's a proof that something's impossible, then there's a world in which it's true. 
So as long as we're talking about a proof system whose notion of syntactic consequence agrees with semantic consequence, it doesn't really matter so much which proof system we're talking about. They're all equivalent in terms of what they're capable of proving from what. They're capable of proving any semantic consequences and nothing else. And the really important thing about a proof system is that it's something that a computer could do. It, we can write a computer program to look at some sort of encoding of a proof and tell us whether or not it's a correct proof. Every proof system is going to have a slightly different function that does this, and depending on that function, we're going to get slightly different VEX programs. Let me show you what the code of the VEX program looks like. It's going to call the is this a proof function uh, from the proof system. So different is proof functions are going to give us different VEX functions, but it's essentially going to be the same program, just with a, a we're, we're doing a substitution of this subroutine. So first of all, the VEX program is going to want to capture its own code completely. I'll show you how to do that in the next slide. Then it's going to want to do a search through all possible strings for proofs. Note that having the ability to tell if something's a proof gives us the ability to go out hunting for proofs. We simply have some sort of systematic way of looking through all possible strings uh, and for each string in our loop, we simply ask whether or not it's a valid proof. If the proof exists, we'll eventually find it and be able to return it, and if not, we will go on forever hunting for a proof that doesn't exist. Our VEX program is going to want to do a modified version of this. It's going to want to simultaneously hunt for two potential proofs. The first is a proof that VEX itself halts. VEX has access to its own code. It's going to somehow formalize that into the proof system, into something that the proof system can understand. And so it's going to look for a proof that it itself halts. It's also simultaneously going to look for a proof that it itself doesn't halt. If it finds a proof that it's supposed to halt, it will do the opposite and go into an infinite loop. If it finds a proof that it itself shouldn't halt, then it will do the opposite, it will halt. If you're familiar with the proof of the halting problem, this is very similar. In the case of the proof of the halting problem, this is used to prove that there's no program that uh, can determine whether or not any arbitrary program halts. But this proof here does not show that a program doesn't exist. We can write this program. There are robust proof systems that we can formalize into something that a computer can understand and write a computer program that checks to see whether or not an encoding of a proof is a valid representation of a proof. We can write a computer program that looks at its own code and interprets it. And we can write a computer program that searches through all possible strings for these proofs. What we can conclude instead is that this program will never find either of these proofs. If it could find a proof that the program itself halted, well, then the program wouldn't halt because it, that would indicate, that would tell it to go into an infinite loop. And if it could find a proof that the program didn't halt, then it would halt. And so it can't find a proof that it halts and it can't find a proof that it doesn't halt. Instead, we know for certain that this VEX program will run forever, never finding any of these proofs. So we know for certain that VEX doesn't halt but there also can't be a proof within our proof system that VEX doesn't halt. Now, of course, you might object to this by saying, oh, well, a computer program can't look at its own code. But this is actually a fairly fun exercise to do with computer programs, is to try to write a computer program that uh, is capable of, for instance, printing out its own code. A program like this is called a quine, and there are some really interesting short quines but there's actually a fairly straightforward procedure for building a quine in any programming language. This presentation was written in LaTeX, and I used this procedure to build a frame that uh, prints out the code that generates it. So how can we resolve the problem of VEX? 
Well, a natural thing to want to do is to add to our proof system a new fact that we didn't know before, that we couldn't prove before, and that's that vex constructed for proof system P doesn't halt. This will produce a new proof system, P prime. Well, the thing is, we can construct a vex program for P prime. And because P prime has a slightly different function for checking to see if something's a valid proof, it's going to have a slightly different vex program. And that vex program for P prime, um, we won't be able to prove that that vex program doesn't halt within P prime. So perhaps we want to add on to P prime an axiom that says that vex of P prime doesn't halt. That will construct a new proof system, P double prime, and so on and so forth. If we continue to do this, we wind up reinventing uh, something called ordinal logic. We can actually continue this process infinitely and a little bit beyond. Unfortunately, in order to understand ordinal logic, we really ought to read Alan Turing's PhD thesis. Turing's PhD thesis is notoriously difficult to read due to the fact that it's written using Church's lambda calculus notation. So I haven't done this yet. Another way of resolving this issue is to not worry so much about formalization. Most mathematicians do their proofs in natural spoken and written language. So they don't worry about having something that you could feed to a computer. On the other hand, I'm quite fond of formalism, and so I'm perfectly content to formalize only portions of mathematics at a time. If we have a particular piece of mathematics, we could be interested in formalizing just that piece. And as long as we're careful, this is perfectly fine. Now, I want to take a look at a model theoretic consequence of what we've been talking about. So we decided that we couldn't prove a contradiction from the assumption that the VEX program for our proof system halts. If we could, then we simply have a proof by contradiction that the VEX program doesn't halt. And we said that we didn't have a proof like that within our proof system. So we cannot prove a contradiction from this assertion, let's call it A, within our proof system. And so there's a structure corresponding to our proof system which satisfies A. There's a structure that our proof system can reason about in which this VEX program halts. We like to call this a non-standard model, uh, either of ZFC set theory or piano arithmetic. Our proof system works perfectly fine for these non-standard models. They're just not the notions of set and the notions of natural number that we're used to working with. But because our proof system works for them, they behave very similarly. Anything that we can prove in our proof system about set theory or about piano arithmetic from the axioms of ZFC or from the axioms of piano arithmetic is going to be true in these non-standard models. It's just that in these non-standard models, it's also going to be true that the VEX program halts. So what does that look like? Well, it turns out these non-standard models are going to have to contain infinite numbers that aren't aware that they're infinite. What do I mean by this? Well, we say that a number is finite if it's part of the smallest set that contains zero and is closed under adding one. And normally this describes the natural numbers. But within these non-standard models, this isn't going to describe the natural numbers. It's going to describe some sort of collection that's larger, that also contains a bunch of infinite numbers. And the reason why is because this non-standard model isn't able to see the actual natural numbers. It thinks that this much larger set is as small as possible, the smallest thing we could get that contains zero and is closed under adding one, and it doesn't see this smaller set that we're aware of. This collection of infinite numbers behaves quite strangely because as far as our proof system can tell, it behaves exactly the same way as the standard natural numbers. In particular, if we have a number, we can always add one, and unless it's zero, we can always subtract one. We can always double a number, uh, and for every other number, we can have it. We can always multiply numbers together, and we can sometimes divide them. And that winds up giving us a really robust collection of infinite numbers, often called non-standard numbers. If you want to get a better sense of what these non-standard models look like, it turns out that looking at the specific details of non-standard models of 
set theory or piano or arithmetic is really quite difficult. These are really complicated and difficult to reason about structures. But I have a video series studying a simpler version of arithmetic where we can actually get a really good handle on what non-standard models look like in this simplified version. And that's a good way to start getting an intuition for what these non-standard models actually look like. I'll link to that video series down below. So anyway, we have this non-standard model of set theory or arithmetic, and what does it mean for our VEX program to halt within this system? Well, that means that there's a list of states that a computer could be in, starting at the start state of computer, uh, and going through what the computer would look like as it executed our VEX program. For instance, if we're thinking about executing VEX as a FRACTRAN program, uh, this would be the list of natural numbers uh, that we got at each step of our program. Now, of course, in our world, we know that there isn't a finite list of steps that take us from the start of executing our VEX program and ends with our VEX program halting. But in this non-standard model of set theory, piano, arithmetic, um, there is a run of the program. There is a sequence. It's just a non-standard length. The length of this sequence of steps that the program goes through is some infinite number that in this model isn't aware that it's infinite. If one isn't careful, one can very easily run into contradictions trying to reason about programs that run for infinite amounts of time. It certainly is the case that if at time t, even if t is a non-standard, one of these infinite numbers, the state at time t plus 1 has to follow from it uh, according to the rules of execution of the program. But there are these gaps between infinite pieces containing these non-standard numbers where one could hope one could do some tricky things but it turns out we're actually prevented from a lot of different tricky things that you might want to pull off uh, in these infinite gaps. So reasoning about programs that have non-standard runtimes is actually really quite difficult. So let's go back to the question of the Collatz conjecture. We know that given a particular proof system, there's a Franktran program that doesn't halt, that can't be proved to not halt within that particular proof system. And we can translate that program into a Collatz-like function. And so regardless of what proof system we wind up solving the Collatz conjecture in, that solution would not be able to generalize to the Franktran program that we got out of that proof system. There are always going to be Collatz-like problems that we don't know the solution to. And this opens up a really troubling possibility. It could be the case that the original Collatz conjecture is one of these problems that isn't provable and isn't disprovable within the standard proof systems of mathematics. If this were the case, there would be models of ZFC set theory and models of piano arithmetic where the Collatz conjecture was true, and there would be models where it's false. Of course, this possibility is unlikely. The Collatz function is such a small thing Whereas the sorts of Collatz-like functions we get out of Franktran programs that do complicated tasks wind up being really complicated. I liken this to the chance that writing a few lines of assembly code could give you a program that's as complicated as possible to analyze. This is unlikely, but until the Collatz problem is resolved, this will probably always be a possibility. So thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions or comments down below, and I hope to see you in a future video.